Hello everyone and welcome back to uh, Mr. Narrator's channel here. It's been a while since I've uploaded a video, but I'm here today to show you how to remove not surface mounted capacitors, but electrolytics from a circuit to be sure that you can remove them effectively and appropriately. From a circuit like this, it's very specific. It's pretty simplistic. I'm going to turn off this light here just so it, the glare, because there's quite a bit of glare here. Make sure you guys can see that. And uh, we'll heat up the uh, soldering iron and we'll see how this goes here. Let's see if we can remove these capacitors. I do have a couple boards uh, that I will be able to use today. It will not just be this board. Uh, this one's very simple. It's actually a board from a subwoofer. Um, it was a project that I was working on and what ended up happening was I thought it was a speaker but realized it didn't have a tweeter on it and these speakers each woofer was two ohms and by the time I had calculated it put it in a circuit there's no way I'm going to be able to run that on a receiver individually uh, separately powered so most receivers the, the ohms that they support speaker wise is going to be around between six and eight ohms sometimes four ohms but these being two ohms with how low they were I'd measured the whole circuit with my meter and it was registering about two or three ohms and that's too risky on a receiver you could blow an output transistor or overload the circuit so I've just decided to, to part it out here and I've saved the woofers and I'm going to show you how to remove these capacitors today so stay tuned for that and uh, we'll get to it here shortly the main thing you want to pay attention to when you're soldering uh, other than the temperature that you're soldering at. I usually, temp, uh, my temperature is usually 350 to 400 Celsius. Okay, you can calculate that Fahrenheit online as well if you're wondering. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, a good idea is usually adding a little bit of solder to each lead individually. Let's see if we can do that here. I recommend starting with one leg, start on one side, pull it up, then start on the other side, and pull it out that way. If you do both of them at the same time and you try to go back and forth and wiggle them out, this could cause a serious problem. For me, in the past, it has broken traces and caused all sorts of connection failure because I wanted something out quicker. I would attempt to yank and pull and go back and forth and I've broken tons of boards that way. So my recommendation to you is when you are taking these out, start on one leg, pull it up, heat up the other leg and pull it out that way. And it doesn't damage anything, it's fine. Uh, these capacitors are not polarized. You also don't see any markings on them for any polarization. Uh, these are non-polarized capacitors. Uh, this is perfectly normal. In most speakers you do not have a polarized capacitor circuit. As they can go in this way or I can put it in the other way. It doesn't matter which way I put it in, the circuit will still function as normal. I have not tested these capacitors. I do have a capacitance tester. I will test these and see if they are good. That is always a good idea to make sure that you are testing all your components to make sure that everything is within specification because one wrong move, one thing goes out of spec, and you might have a circuit that doesn't function right or things start having issues. With some receivers, you'll lose settings. You'll lose the memory on certain receivers. They usually end up having an issue where they do not recall your settings. You shut them off, turn them back on, and you're like, I swear, I just set this setting to have more bass or more treble. You turn it back on, and it forgot everything. That is usually a memory battery or a memory capacitor that fails. And they're not always obvious. You have to go in and troubleshoot and figure out the voltages and what's in and out of spec. And most of the time, you have to remove them from the circuit to do that because when you test them in circuit, it's not always the most accurate measurement with all the other components that are around it. So as you can see, we've removed both these capacitors. These are actually 100 volts at uh, 100 microfarads. So 100 UF, uh, 100 microfarads at 100 volts, which is perfectly normal uh, for this type of operation. Usually they are a high voltage with the same microfarad or a high voltage with a lower microfarad rating They're usually i've had some that are 5.5 or 8 microfarads at 100 or even 150 volts just depends on the capacitor type and, and various factors usually there is a capacitor in line sometimes they're smaller than this they're usually not this bulky um, they're usually in line with a tweeter to protect the tweeter so it's not getting a full signal so the tweeter doesn't 
either catch on fire or explode or blow prematurely, the capacitor usually is in line to protect that tweeter and to route and control what frequencies are sent to that tweeter. You will also get resistors that are in line. I'm not talking about very thin resistors. I'm talking about 5 watt resistors. You can look them up on Google. Uh, between 5 and 10 watt resistors, they're very bulky. Some of them are shaped like a rectangle. They're a lot larger. This is because when you're sending a lot of voltage and or current as being pulled through a speaker, they can heat up quite a bit. The smaller ones, they don't do as well with that when you're pulling a lot through the circuit. So that would be uh, the case there. You usually get 5 or 10 watt resistors that are in a circuit at that voltage. I'm going to pull another board over here um, to show you guys uh, how to remove capacitors that are on different style boards. This is kind of a unique situation, but it's also... Um, it's uncommon in the way that when you're working on things uh, with a motherboard scenario per se. This is this is a terminal block connection, you know, on the other side. Um, these are the binding posts. This is very, you know, some of them are old-fashioned. They look nice, though. I, I did clean them up a little bit, but uh, I'd like to save them. But you push down, you stick your speaker wire in, you let go, and it pinches your wire in there. Some of them are screw-on. Some of them had deadbolt plug inserts. You can plug them straight in and it works and this one's just unique so it's definitely uh, an interesting scenario so let me grab another board for the more common circuits now this here is a paradigm uh, subwoofer board usually these paradigms are made in Canada this one specifically had an issue I believe it does have to do with capacitors it's, or it could be a short with a transistor you would plug it in and the volume would be very 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 low so to fix that uh, with some of these it was just connections other times uh, it was all the capacitors had to be replaced in the subs this is not an uncommon thing especially for paradigm specifically they usually make good quality things um, but in, in this instance with this spe specific model subwoofer I have heard quite a few complaints even Klipsha um, has a lot of subwoofers that have issues with getting loud uh, or you know they just don't sound like they used to in your first bomb that's components going out of specification so the first thing I've done is I've removed the knobs here at the top uh, I'll flip it over and show you guys what's going on here, okay? So you have a fuse that's in, in line here, so you're not overdrawing and, you know, you're not going to blow up the amplifier that's inside of the sub. You draw too much, it's going to blow. A lot of people had issues with that with this model, too. They had to replace the fuse a lot. The problem is you don't replace the fuse with the right type of fuse. If you have, let's say, a 5-amp fuse in here and you replace it with a 10-amp fuse, you're going to be able to draw a lot more amperage, and this thing could actually short out... Uh, catch on fire, smoke. I mean, it could have a lot of issues because you're bypassing, you're actually increasing the amount of current you can draw through the circuit. So you definitely have to match everything. Whatever you take out of here, and the manufacturer says it's a 3 amp or a 5 amp fuse, it will usually tell you on the plate. It says 3 amps, 250 volts. So it's a 3 amp fuse. If you go any higher than that, you risk burning something up in here. It's okay to go lower, but if you go lower and you start turning it up and it starts really drawing, it'll probably blow prematurely, the fuse. So 3 amp, 250 volt for this circuit specifically. Uh, this transformer here, I'm not sure if it's a step up or step down transformer. It's just uh, adequate for the voltages. Usually it's AC coming in, AC going out. Not always, it just depends on the situation. But in this instance, it is uh, AC coming in, AC going out, and power parts of the circuit. Uh, most likely getting converted to uh, DC voltages as well going through because these capacitors on here, uh, down on this board, uh, this is like a separate board. It may be the audio input board, I believe. It looks like it's the low level input here for right and left you have the phase this kind of changed the sound a little bit you got auto for auto detection of when the subwoofer is on and then off completely so the subwoofer is completely off or all the way to the left which is completely on all the time you know it's always on so it's not having to detect the input it's just constantly on and it's ready whenever you are uh, you see two capacitors here and they have little covers on them on the top you just got to be careful if these have ever been plugged in make sure you're checking these with your meter you do not want to get electrocuted by them capacitors are not a joke they can blow you back against a wall they can stop your heart if you're not careful so safety is always number one priority so make sure that you're being very careful whenever you are working around capacitors and don't just go poking in there with a screwdriver or with your hands uh, just make sure that you're being safe about it. You're checking voltages and giving it maybe even up to 24 hours after unplugging it before you just go in there and start messing with things because there could be lethal voltages in there that are slowly trickling down. These capacitors can hold the charge for a very long time depending on the rating. Uh, voltage and microfarad rating all go into uh, factoring that out. So it, it all means something. So I'm going to remove this board down here and we're going to work on getting some of these small capacitors out. We'll see what we can do. This is a 
It's similar to a ribbing cable, uh, but this has a specialized way that they put it in. These are soldered in. There's no removing these. Uh, this is not uncommon. It happens in some cheaper receivers too. Um, you cannot remove these cables by hand. These do not come out. You have to unsolder all of the pins and remove them manually. You'll also see this orange uh, yellowish looking uh, liquid. It is not a straight liquid. It is actually a glue to hold the connector in place. And the only reason they're there is to preserve the item and keep the cable in place during shipping when they ship these items. It really has no other purpose because this glue is horrible. It rots, it will destroy the circuit it's a part of, it can actually short out parts. If you ever find this circuit glue, uh, you can work on removing it at any time. You can use a little knife to carve back. Be very careful. If, you, if it's something you care about and it is working, be very careful about removing that. Unless you have a serious problem, there's not really a reason to open anything. Um, sometimes with tweezers, you can get it and you can remove parts of it, uh, but it's very stubborn. Uh, it's, it's a big pain. Um, normally, the best way to soften that up is also with a little alcohol. So if you have 70%, I'd say don't go under 70%. 70% isopropyl between 70 and 99% isopropyl is perfectly fine to use. I have not had an issue using that. Uh, you can use just distilled water. I wouldn't use straight water, obviously, if it's a circuit that you care about, something you're washing. I know people who have done it, uh, but I do not personally recommend it. Do not use acetone. Acetone is another thing a lot of people will talk about using on these circuits. Be very careful with acetone. It can seriously eat away and destroy all kinds of stuff. It can be very damaging, but there is people that use it in small amounts, and it happens to work for them, but every board is different. Every circuit is different. You never know, so just be very careful. My recommendation would be distilled water if you want your own contact cleaner. If not, you can go over to Walmart or go on Amazon and you can get contact cleaner. Uh, there is deoxid that's very expensive. At the moment, it is $16.99 for a can. It used to be $20. It's gone down a little bit. Um, they have multiple different manufacturers uh, that make tons of different contact cleaner. I know a good control cleaner is Neutral. Uh, Neutral is a good uh, control cleaner for little knobs and switches. You only use deoxit fader lube. You can see it online. Fader lube is for pots and switches. D5 is for buttons and controls. So if you want to use it on controls and switches, that's perfectly fine. Deoxit D5 is the red can, and Deoxit Fader Lube is for controls like this. I have actually myself destroyed volume pots because I used it without doing my research on it. So I always tell people, make sure you do your research. Don't destroy things like I did. That's how you learn, though. That's how you learn. It's not bad if you, you know, we all break things, and that's, that's the best way to learn sometimes. So you just don't want it to be something that's very expensive, that's irreplaceable, that you break. So make sure it's something uh, that you can learn from. Like a circuit like this, you know, I'm not going to put, you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars into something that's not only over, you know, five, six, seven years old, uh, but to me, it's not really as worth much as the original purchaser was. I have re uh, received this unit from Goodwill and it, it worked for a while for me uh, at a very uh, low volume and at a low price that I paid for it. So it's good to learn from circuits like this. So take this as an example and find things like that at a, at a secondhand store or a, a thrift store and try to learn from it that way. So I'm going to get this board out of here for you guys and uh, we're going to see if we can remove some capacitors here. So we're removing this board. We took a screw out of here. I pulled that out. And then if you're wondering about the rest of it, you have to get these little these little nuts here come off, off the shaft. They kind of slide off there after you undo them. You might have to use a pair of pliers. Be very careful if it's something you care about. Once again, uh, if you scratch the chassis or something happens, you may have to repaint to fix it. So after that, we just lift this and it comes right off. I have to move these little washers here that were also part of the shaft away. I pull that off. We see it's still connected. Uh, which is connected by this cable here. I also had one of the little, there's these little spars. I assume they're, they may be parts of grounds in the circuit. These came off, these fell off of the ends of the switch, which is perfectly normal. And you have to have a pretty good memory of putting these things back together. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, the way I started uh, figuring out how to put these circuits back together uh, was when I started taking photos of every step. So every step you take, take picture of the parts, parts you're working on, uh, it'll make it a lot easier for you and a lot easier to remember too. I will see if I can get this cable desoldered here I'm gonna see if I can do that. I might have to do that off camera because this is a this can be a difficult connector I'm going to give it a try here and see if we can do it this way and if it takes me more than I don't know I'd say 
couple minutes here and may just be better off taking it off separately. So we will see if I can do that first. Uh, what I'm going to do with a connector of this style is I'm going to add a little bit of flux here. So we add that across. I use chip quick flux. If you guys are wondering, that's what I use there. Uh, you can get it on Amazon if you want it. It's fantastic stuff. It's always worked for me. It's very good. Matter of fact, the other day I fixed a key fob with it. Um, it really is great stuff. Key fob had a memory problem and it ended up having a real, real problem not communicating with the car efficiently. And after adding that flux on there, I figured it was something to do with the data chip that stores the memory of what car it's on, you know, what, what car it's associated with and programmed to. The programming was, was corrupt or something because of, of a connection problem. So I redid the connection there and it fixed the key fob. Key fob's like new. So before you go to the dealership or wherever you're going to go to get another key fob or even reprogramming it, make sure that you check the connections on the chip. I'm using a little braid here. This is a copper braid. It is a desoldering wick, as a lot of people will know it as. It's very effective at removing solder. The problem is with these cheaper ones is normally you have to add a huge amount of flux. So I have to use maybe a quarter of the tube just to get the stuff to stick. So sometimes you do, but uh, that, that does not happen with a lot of the other brands. I bought a really cheap one. I got like three of them for five dollars. So uh, They're usually a little bit more expensive than that if you're buying them from a reputable seller. So I'm seeing if we can get this one off here. We may be able to get it out. It can be very stubborn. Other times they come right out. I can feel that the glue also has it held in and I have to use another hand here to see if I can pull it out. Yeah, the glue really has a bond on this cable to the board. That's the biggest problem is that glue. It's always been a problem. So we will see if we can get that out here. I'm going to spray a little alcohol on here. To, this, this alcohol is 99%. It will soften the bond of the glue to the board. Okay, we're getting it out. It is coming. It is breaking the bond of glue. I'm going to make sure I solder here a little bit because we still got one pin. One pin that's held in there. A little too tight. There we go. Came right out. If you are yanking and pulling with all your force and it is not coming out, uh, you are doing something incorrectly. I can tell you in most cases that is true. So take a step back, relax, take a deep breath, and try, try again if it's not working for you. If you're pulling way too hard with too much force, it will not work for you. So this is the cable here. And uh, it's pretty stubborn. If you saw my soldering iron, I knew I was touching it earlier. Like I said, this isn't something we're putting back together. But if you are putting something back together and you want to be very careful with this type of cable, you don't want to be laying your soldering iron on there and having it burning, burning, burning away because eventually this will get exposed. I mean, these are all wires just covered up uh, by this coating here. If you have a wire that's exposed and something happens to it or it touches the chassis or anywhere else in the circuit, it could short out. It could short to ground, which is a very bad short, especially if this isn't a ground reference weight. If it's something, you know, like a voltage going straight to the ground, uh, that could be a safety problem too. And the circuit will probably won't function if that's the case. So definitely be careful there. In that instance, what I would do is I would actually cut this connection out. I would kind of tape it up a bit and then run a jumper wire from here to wherever the other end of the circuit is that would be safer so using a jumper wire with appropriate coating and appropriate length there for your circuit would fix that problem but definitely be very careful with that okay so we have just this board you see this jumper wire here i'm not sure if they use this if this was serviced or if this was like this i'm not sure it looks like some kind of a ground reference it loops around here hits the edge comes back over looks like it goes up and then it goes where I cannot see it. It kind of goes in here. It could definitely be either a negative or a ground, some kind of a reference here, because I know these, sometimes when you measure the grounds, these will be connected to it. It just depends on the circuit. So I'm not sure about this one, but it's definitely looped through here. It goes under and connects all the way on this side on the edge here. So something, maybe a missing connection or something. I see this part of it over here that's also part of it it starts here and goes all the way through there so sometimes if they miss something or sometimes if a connection burns up there's nothing obvious that looks really detrimental on here um, this may just be flux that I 
add on there earlier actually if I take my little brush here I can see if it'll come off yeah that came off so that that wasn't anything that you saw yellow here thinking that was a burnt connection this was the connector we removed that's why these holes are missing here in case you're wondering these holes that's where the connector was that we just removed so um, there's nothing obvious it's burnt trace wise so I'm thinking this was from the manufacturer sometimes they forget a trace or a track if there's an error in it they will they will have everybody do this on the line to make sure this connects with everything in the circuit appropriately once again, we see this glue here. This is black. This is actually, a lot of the time, if it's black or white, it's okay. But then it starts turning orange or brown. And that's when it starts to become really, really uh, conductive, actually. And start creating a lot of problems in the circuit. So be sure to remove it uh, if it looks orange, brown, you know, really nasty. Actually, a lot of the time, people mistake it for leaking capacitor. So capacitors sometimes when they fail they leak right uh, or they get bulged heads well not all failed capacitors look like that sometimes they don't uh, they just fail naturally and you have to remove them and test them to know so with this here some people might think oh well look this what's this nasty stuff right here you know well this is where this is where that connector was first of all but some people would think well look at this stuff this this must be the capacitor leaking you know if i turn on my light here look this must be the capacitor leaking right no not necessarily this is that crappy glue although it's black okay but you'd be surprised. A lot of people assume that it is something specifically like a capacitor leaking or something like that when really it's the glue that's creating all the issue. So we could try to remove this capacitor on the edge. We'll see if that's possible. You can kind of see the leads here. It looks like there's two of them. Now we'll see if we can remove that. It's best to have it on the edge sometimes so you can get it off. Not all the time, but sometimes it's the only way to do it. Get your thumb on there. Kind of remove it out and get the other side. And voila, there you go. That's one capacitor down. And we'll see if we can remove more. You may notice that I'm not using the uh, desoldering wick as much. Um, this is specifically because if you start, you know, I, I like to conserve it, you know. I mean, if you want to use it on every single capacitor, uh, you can. There's no wrong way like that to do it. The wrong way of removing a capacitor would be doing both sides at the same time, wiggling back and forth, and that heat allows the copper traces on these boards to lift, and you will have broken or lifted traces, and those are a total pain uh, to handle. That can happen with any component, several, you know, three, four, five-legged transistors, which are I believe they're kind of obsolete now. I don't think they really do much with them. Uh, five, four or five legged transistors are not uh, very common in circuits anymore, but they do still have three legged, of course, and receivers and output transistors as MOSFETs. So, um, yeah, see if I can start on this one here. I kind of feel it getting loose. So I kind of pull a little bit with my finger and I heat up the other side there and it falls right out. Look how easy that is. It's fantastic. So you would go through every capacitor uh, in your circuit there and go through and remove and recap now i would not remove all of them all at once and try to remember which goes where that is a that is a painstakingly a horrible idea i'm sorry but it is unless you're an expert at this you've been doing this a long time that is never a good idea to do that so uh but this one is a 50 volt at 22 uf so 50 volt at 22 microfarads okay um changing that value, manipulating it, or changing the capacitor that's there. The entire circuit may malfunction, it may not work at all, or it may work and it might, you know, might work differently. Uh, it's hard to know exactly, you know, until you really switch it out. It's kind of unpredictable. So I always say replace with the same part that, you know, you got, that you have, uh, that was already there to begin with. Yeah, when it comes to that, these capacitors, there's quite a few of them. So if you, re if you removed all the capacitors in this whole circuit and then tried to recap, unless you have a service manual or some kind of, you know, diagram to pull, you've pretty much forgotten where, you know, all these went. So I would highly recommend you do one at a time, take one out, put the replacing one in. Take one out that's failed, put the replacing one in. Take one out, you know, test, make sure it's bad, then put the replacement in. Uh, so on until your board is completely recapped and redone if you want to do recapping which usually that's not necessary unless your receiver is you know i'd have to say 40 50 years old i mean you'd have to have a receiver from the 60s or 70s to, to need to recap it most receivers do not need to be recapped you know every five years there's people that recap their receivers you know every five six years that is unnecessary i mean i, I understand 
there's different qualities with different parts. I agree with that. Different capacitors and different ratings, different temperature and different lifespan. I agree. If you're going to replace them and you think it's necessary, replace it with a capacitor that's good quality. Uh, some people like, uh, I believe it's Jamiecon, uh, and there is Rubicon. They're very expensive, if I remember. I know some people like Nishikon. I like um, Nishikon and, uh, yeah, I think it's Nishikon or uh, Panasonic. So Nishikon or Panasonic, they are both very good. I like Rubicon. They're just very expensive. So, you know, they're, they're audio-grade capacitors. You could recap an entire receiver with that, and, and it would be, it'd be, it'd be fantastic. They'd last a very long time compared to most capacitors. So they're very expensive, though. You, you could spend upwards of $200. I'd even say $400, depending on what receiver you have, to completely recap all of it. I mean, that plus if you're doing it yourself, you'd save money. If you sent it to a place, you'd probably be in the, you'd, you'd be at new receiver prices if you sent it to a place. You might even be in new receiver prices. You know, you might be able to replace your current receiver for less than what it would cost you to recap. So you have to calculate the cost versus the benefit of every circuit, whether it be a subwoofer, a speaker, a receiver. But speakers, in my opinion, they are the best because they're so simplistic and they only use a few capacitors like what we saw earlier, just a couple of them, you know, usually between 50 and 100 volts at around either 100 microfarads or less. So, you know, it just depends on the situation. And if you want your soldering iron to have a, well, I should say the soldering iron tip to have a longer lifespan. You see, my tip is good, you know, it's okay. Uh, I've actually had this tip for nearly three years now. You can apply a little bit of solder to it, okay, and you can clean it. Now, some people use the wet sponge. I have not found that to be very effective. I've actually had to replace every tip every month or two using the sponge method, and it did not work for me. But adding a little tin here to your soldering iron tip, clean it, put it away, shut it down let it cool on there so it has that nice gloss when you pull it back out again if you put it away and you are not retinning the tip you aren't keeping it clean and you just put it back in there it's gonna uh oxidize the surface of it and it's going to become so impossible to stick anything on there and to heat anything you'll actually have to throw it away and replace the tip because the coating is just gone now i have a lot of really small micro style tips here um, I do have a couple of them. I got them off Amazon. They're real. They're real cheap. They're nothing high end. But I haven't had to use a single one of them because they take care of my my tips down here. So maintaining your soldering iron tips is also a very important part because you can't solder without soldering iron tips, and you do not want to be replacing your tips every week or every month. You want to, you know, you want to replace them as less as possible. Uh, it saves you money in the long run, just like you know with capacitors or any other component uh, in a circuit. You want to spend a good amount of money to make sure you don't have to be replacing them frequently, more often. So I hope this video was helpful for you guys. Um, leave a comment down below, please. Uh, do subscribe to the channel. Uh, we hope to be rolling out um, more videos more frequently. I've been in school right now hoping to do um, medical equipment repair. And been learning a lot about manufacturing, about soldering, robotics, quality inspection, all that great stuff. So it's definitely something I've been busy for sure. But when I get the time, I absolutely uh, want to make videos for you guys. So it's always a pleasure and uh, always always a, a fun time we try to have to, you know, whether it be removing capacitors or, you know, redoing connections on speakers, whatever it may be. Uh, and if you have any recommendations, you guys want to see something specific, you know, a certain video or whatever it may be, uh, just let me know down in the comments. So thanks so much for watching. I will catch you guys next time.